In this screencast, we will be discussing the etiologies and patterns of small bowel inflammation. At the end of this screencast, I hope you will be able to identify and describe the different manifestations of inflammation and provide a differential diagnosis for the etiology of inflammation of the small bowel. So let's start talking about small bowel inflammation in general. Small bowel inflammation is typically characterized by a pattern of mural stratification. The mural stratification that results in wall thickening of the bowel often has some associated stranding or edema within the mesentery and may also see adenopathy within the distribution of the inflammation. Etiologies are listed here, so inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease, infection, graft versus host disease, vasculitis, and drug reactions are going to be the most common etiologies and should be the foundation of your differential when you see mural stratification and mesenteric edema. Crohn's disease is going to be the most common form of small bowel inflammation that you're going to encounter in your practice. When we talk about mural stratification, mural stratification is a form of wall thickening of the small bowel where the submucosa of the small bowel becomes edematous or inflamed. This causes thickening of the wall with low attenuation submucosa. The inner wall of the bowel or the mucosa often appears hyperemic to the submucosa and the outer wall may also appear hyperemic. When we talk about Crohn's disease, Crohn's disease is characterized by skip lesions or segmental transmural inflammation. We can break Crohn's disease down into three basic components. Active inflammation, where you have an inflammatory process that's resulting in wall thickening and edema. You have arterial hyperenhancement of the inner wall, what used to be referred to as mucosal hyperemia. However, we now know that often in Crohn's disease that mucosa has actually been eroded or ulcerated and the mucosa itself may not be present. You will often have stranding associated with active inflammation. So when you see mural stratification, luminal narrowing, inner wall hyperenhancement, mesenteric stranding, those are the cornerstones of active inflammation and that's what we need to be calling the findings of Crohn's disease when they come together like that active inflammation which is often treated medically as opposed to surgically we then have stricturing disease stricturing disease tends to be more of a chronic form of Crohn's disease in which there's luminal narrowing and fibrosis that's resulting in upstream dilation or even obstruction of the bowel. So in this case in these cases you can have superimposed active inflammation but in chronic stricturing disease even after you treat medically to reduce the Crohn's flare you still have obstructive symptoms and stricturing disease tends to be managed surgically. Penetrating disease is the most severe form of Crohn's disease. In penetrating disease, we tend to see abscess formation, or what is now often referred to as an inflammatory mass. And we can also see the formation of fistula. Fistula can be between loops of small bowel, between small bowel and colon, between colon and the vagina or the bladder, or between small bowel and the vagina or the bladder. Penetrating disease is distinct from active inflammation or stricturing disease in that it often is treated medically in the hyperacute phase and once the active inflammation is decreased, a surgical intervention is often necessary, although we are moving more to interventional radiology treatments such as percutaneous drainage of abscesses or inflammatory masses. Infectious enteritis is another common form of small bowel inflammation. It is often characterized by mural stratification similar to Crohn's disease, but typically the mural stratification and affected segments of small bowel are continuous and long segment, as opposed to multiple short discontinuous segments as we see within Crohn's disease. 
You can have both bi viral and bacterial causes of enteritis. Some classic etiologies for bacterial infection are going to be Yersinia or tuberculosis, and these tend to selectively involve the terminal ileum and the cecum. Viral enteritis tends to be more diffuse or long segment, and it's often mild. Many times, viral enteritis will have no apparent radiographic manifestation. Tiflitis is another type of infectious enteritis that is seen in immunocompromised patients, often patients who have neutropenia. It is felt that in patients with severe neutropenia, there is transmural migration of small bowel or colonic flora that results in inflammation of the bowel wall. Here on our right hand side we see two different examples of infectious enteritis. The top example is related to CMV virus and it is affecting the ileum. We can see mural stratification where there's inner wall hyperenhancement and submucosal edema. We see associated stranding in the mesentery and we also see increased vascularity of the mesentery often referred to as mesenteric hyperemia. In the lower example, we see long segment, severe wall thickening. Again, this is in a mural stratification pattern where we see that low attenuation submucosal edema and the inner wall mucosal hyperemia or inner wall enhancement. We can see some free fluid in this example and some associated mesenteric edema. This was a person who had eaten shellfish in Charleston and came down with Edzwardiella tarda ileitis previously known as Vibrio cholera. Graft-versus-host disease is a form of small bowel inflammation that is commonly seen in tertiary and quaternary care centers that are treating patients with leukemia, amyloidosis, lymphoma, multiple myeloma, or any other condition that may require a bone marrow transplant. In graft-versus-host disease, the transplanted hematopoietic cells generate white blood cells that go and re attack the recipient's tissue. The tissues that are most commonly affected are the bowel, the skin, and the liver. The first manifestation of graft-versus-host disease clinically is often diarrhea or a rash. Hyperbilirubinemia can often be seen as well on laboratory tests. There are both acute and chronic forms of graft-versus-host disease. You often treat graft-versus-host disease with immunosuppression. And in graft-versus-host disease, similar to infectious enteritis, you tend to see a long segment of affected bowel. The wall thickening related to graft-versus-host disease often results in a mural stratification with a mucosal hyperenhancement. You can sometimes see some bowel dilation and there is very commonly mesenteric edema, a comb sign or mesenteric hyperemia and ascites. So similar to infectious enteritis, graft versus host disease is long segment mural stratification of the small bowel. And the biggest way you can differentiate these two is infectious enteritis tends to occur more commonly in neutropenic patients, or immunocompromised patients who have not yet received a bone marrow transplant, where graft-versus-host disease is isolated to patients who have undergone bone marrow transplantation. Here we can see on the right-hand side of our screen an example of graft-versus-host disease where we have almost all of the small bowel within our field of view affected. There's wall thickening, there's submucosal edema, inner wall hyperenhancement, mesenteric stranding, and mucosal hyperemia. Small vessel vasculitis is sort of a wastebasket term for a large number of different autoimmune conditions. The most common ones are going to be C. anca, or previously known as Wegener's granulomatosis, lupus, and rheumatoid arthritis. There is a wide variety of presentations of vasculitis, but whenever you do see long segment wall thickening and you don't have some other etiology to explain the small bowel wall thickening, vasculitis is going to be within your differential. While vasculitis can present with these similar findings of long segment mural stratification and 
mucosal hyperemia, mesenteric edema. It doesn't necessarily have to present that way. Uh, and, and that's due to the heterogeneity of all the different vasculitides that you can encounter. But remember in the back of your mind when you see some abnormal bowel wall that vasculitis is one of those things that can mimic a lot of other pathologies and should often be within your differential. A commonly forgotten etiology for small bowel inflammation is drug-related inflammation. There's multiple different types of drug-related inf inflammation. One that often comes to people's mind is related to non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories tend to affect the stomach and duodenum as opposed to the jejunum or the ileum, and it can result in duodenal webs and strictures, peptic ulcer disease, and you may see mural stratification within the duodenum. And if you see something impacting the duodenum, you you know the duodenum is less frequently involved with these infectious enteritises or these etiologies related to being immunocompromised. And so start to think of NSAIDs as a common etiology when you see edema within the duodenum. ACE inhibitors can also impact the small bowel. The ACE inhibitors cause angioedema within the small bowel, and that's going to manifest as long segment mural stratification. It's often presenting with chronic or recurrent nausea or abdominal pain, and it just doesn't often come to the mind of the radiologist or the primary care physician that the patient's on an ACE inhibitor, such as lisinopril, and this can be a misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed etiology of chronic small bowel inflammation. Chemotherapy can result in an enteritis, and in the case of chemotherapy, the enteritis results from the chemotherapy disrupting cell division of the mucosa. So the mucosa is one of the more rapidly dividing cell populations in our body and because chemotherapy is trying to target cell division the mucosa can be impacted by the chemotherapy. That mucosa dying can allow transmural migration of small bowel flora and cause inflammation and even bacteremia. One of the most common chemotherapy agents to result in enteritis is a renotecan, and a renotecan is a common agent to treat colon cancer. Radiation enteritis is another commonly encountered etiology for small bowel inflammation. The loops of bowel that are affected by radiation therapy tend to be those loops of bowel which fall within the radiated field. So if a person has cervical cancer and there are low-lying loops of ileum, or if the person has retroperitoneal adenopathy, the loops of bowel in the central abdomen will often be impacted by the radiation. Similar to chemotherapy, the radiation often disproportionately impacts rapidly dividing cell populations, which the mucosa of the bowel is. So you get inflammation or cell death within the mucosa, and that results in acute inflammation and edema that may manifest as mural stratification in the you know, period of time while the patient's receiving radiation or soon after receiving radiation. And then after the radiation therapy has been terminated, over time, that active inflammation can result in fibrosis and scarring of the bowel, and it can also result in a small vessel vasculitis that causes ischemia. So the chronic manifestations of radiation enteritis tend to be stricture or can even be fistulization with adjacent organs, such as fistulization to the bladder or the vagina or the colon. In summary, Small bowel inflammation tends to be characterized by uniform circumferential wall thickening. This is nonspecific, but most commonly it's inflammation or edema that causes that uniform wall thickening. When you do have IV contrast, you often see a mural stratification pattern with submucosal edema and inner wall hyperenhancement. 
inflammation tends to also cause edema within the mesentery, so look for mesenteric stranding associated with mural stratification. If you see short segment or multiple segments, and particularly a short segment of terminal ileum with other skip lesions proximal, think about Crohn's disease. If you see something isolated to the terminal ileum, start to think infectious etiologies such as tuberculosis or Yersinia or Crohn's disease. If you see very long segment or diffuse involvement of the small bowel, you want to start thinking about viral infections, less commonly bacterial infections, ischemia, angioedema related to ACE inhibitors, or the various vasculitides.